Joe, how often do you think about killing the Andersons? It's in my mind all the time. What you did to my daughter, Teresa Ann Marie Lynch, was evil, hateful, and despicable. You are now dead and rotting and repulsive to me. This is Joseph McEnroe, a triple homicide convict from Washington State. On Christmas Eve in 2007, Joseph and his then-girlfriend Michelle Anderson decided to murder six members of her family, including two children. This sent a paralyzing horror through the community of Carnation, Washington, and it's not hard to see why. The 911 call reporting the incident painted one of the most gruesome images of any murder incident in the country. 911. Uh, there's been a murder. There's three people dead that I can see right now. Inside? I just came up. She works with me. Inside the house? Yes. What do you see? There's a baby and a man and a woman, and she's my best friend. Now, in court, a tense atmosphere enveloped the room. Every eye was on McEnroe as he faced a grueling cross-examination as he remained cold and unbothered through most of the trial. So I move quickly forward into the... Um down the hall and into into the uh, no, I'm ready down the hall into the kitchen, and she comes around from the other end of the kitchen. You said you move forward. What is forward? Is this from right to left? Then again, why? I just. You've got a point here. No bullets have been fired, right? Do you recall what was going through your head as you pulled the trigger and shot the gun at Wayne? Nothing. Just okay. nothing. But the facade crumbled during his sentencing trial. His recount of the gruesome murders triggered an unexpected meltdown, shedding a haunting light on the dark abyss within. We're going to talk about what happened on December 24th, okay? Yes. Tell us now, first of all, in that last month, four weeks, you're up there at the trailer. What were you doing, doing during those four weeks? Is it to bait a trap? No, it's because we can't just leave these dead people here, okay? So I moved... So I went and um, moved Judy Frost. I put a bag over her head because I couldn't look at her because of see the emptiness. Well, the, she should be. Harshly condemning McEnroe's cowardly act, the presiding judge will now deliver the sentence. In a matter of moments, you became their judge, jury, and executioner. They were defenseless before you as you wielded your firearm. There was no opportunity for them to save themselves, to obtain a reprieve, or to save each other. They were cowardly ambushed on Christmas Eve, a time when they expected nothing but joy and goodwill. Although your life has been spared, Mr. McEnroe, this court now sentences you to the harshest sentence otherwise available under the law. Life imprisonment without the possibility of release or parole on count one for the murder of Wayne Anderson. Life imprisonment without the possibility of release or parole on count two for the murder of Judy Anderson. Life imprisonment without the possibility of release or parole on count three for the murder of Scott Anderson. Life imprisonment without the possibility of release or parole on count four for the murder of Erica Anderson. Life imprisonment without the possibility of release or parole on count five for the murder of Olivia Anderson. And life imprisonment without the possibility of release or parole on count six for the murder of Nathan Anderson. Despite the life sentence, McEnroe, showing no signs of remorse, is appealing the sentence and verdict. Joseph McEnroe's courtroom meltdown showcased the emotional tumult of a merciless killer, but how does it compare to other shocking courtroom scenes, like in the case of Daryl Brooks, a sex offender turned six-time murderer? How can you even call yourself Mr. a judge? Brooks, I need to make a record of I need to things. make a record too. When am I going to get the chance to do that? 
All right, I need to make a record. He's being removed to the other courtroom. He is yelling at me. On November 21st, 2021, Daryl Brooks drove an SUV through the annual Christmas parade in Waukesha, Wisconsin, killing six people and injuring 62 others. Wow! On fleeing the ghastly crime scene, Brooks knocked on the front door of a home, claiming that he was homeless and needed to use a phone to call an Uber. When the residents answered, the kind homeowner who gave Daryl a burger and warm jacket soon realized that something was wrong. They asked him to exit their property. Police had arrived and taken him into custody. As the court opened its doors for Brooks's trial, the world witnessed a chilling calmness, not inspired by an ironclad defense, because his defense was anything but clear. The defense witnesses he brought forth only added to the tension that thickened with each passing moment. What were you doing the evening of November 21st, 2021, before linking up with the alleged defendant? Hanging with my roommate at the time at Frame Park. And what were you and your roommate doing? I'll okay. object. We covered this ground during her testimony previously. Objection and grounds for I object to that and grounds for the objection on behalf of the state. But as the trial progressed, the calm surface withered. Brooks's agitation surfaced as he scrambled for documents during a heated moment in court, his self-representation not helping his case in the least. Your Honor, I'm, we're not going to move past this, seeing as how you took an oath to protect the Constitution. I have your oath. I have a copy of your oath right here. The oath that you took, Your Honor. Mr. Brooks, I'd like to continue with testimony. To we have witnesses waiting for you. Please call your next witness. The oath that you swore to protect the Constitution, which you are now not doing. Mr. Brooks, so you're going call your next your witness, sworn please. Oath. You're going against your sworn oath. I will make the record when we get back. I will step off, but Mr. Brooks, you're being it taken no to Mr. the next no courtroom. Mr. Brooks. Don't try to address me Thank like you. that, like we cool. You don't have no integrity. How can you even call yourself a judge? Make it type of agreements, being biased, judicial misconduct. Victims of Brooks's horrible crimes came in their numbers to share their heartbreaking stories and utter revulsion at his continued existence. On November 21st, you killed my mother. And in this courtroom, I watched you run her down and her broken body slide across the concrete. This woman loved and she was loved. You ran her down like she was nothing. And since that day, you have shown no remorse You'd offered no explanation for your atrocities. It offends me that you're sitting here breathing while she is not. You are a monster. You deserve contempt and death. My name is Chris Owen, and I am the plaintiff. I am here on behalf of another plaintiff, my mother, Leanna Joy Owen. The reason none of the witnesses saw her in this courtroom is because she was executed by a killing offender. Now my dad has nightmares of her body flying through the air and shattering against concrete. Yeah, shake your head. Shake your head. You know, because that is what you took from me. And there's, there's nothing this court can do that would provide justice in my eyes. So all I ask is that you rot, and you rot slow. The heat was on, and the calm charade soon came unraveling as the jury's verdict resounded through the courtroom, guilty in all 76 counts. The once stoic mask shattered as Brooks's head sank into his hands. All right, I will read each one into the record. 
We, the jury, find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first-degree intentional homicide as charged in count one of the information. We, the jury, find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first-degree intentional homicide as charged in count six of the information, dated today's date, signed by the foreperson. Did the defendant commit first-degree intentional homicide while using a dangerous weapon? Answer, yes. Now, as Brooks faces the consequences of his actions, how does his epic court meltdown compare to that of Tobias Roman, whose fury escalated from alleged stalking to death threats against a judge? You got one more chance and then you're gonna be removed from the courtroom. And that'll be your choice. Don't talk, go ahead here. Alright, you need to leave. In Bakersfield, California, Roman faced multiple felonies for reportedly stalking a woman at Valley Plaza Mall. What seemed like a straightforward trial quickly turned explosive. Uh, at this time, I will appoint the public defender to represent uh, Mr. Roman. The charges, Mr. Roman, are attempted robbery. Saw lot, saw lie, hey, Mr. Roman, you need to be quiet. As the judge presided over his case, Roman's wrath bubbled over. The courtroom fell into stunned silence as he hurled threats at the judge vowing murder in a chilling tone that echoed through the halls of justice. You have one more chance and then you're going to be removed from the courtroom. And that'll be your choice. Just don't talk. Go in here. Right. You need to leave. Okay. You want to see. The audacity of Roman's threat sent shockwaves through the courtroom, a blatant display of uncontrollable rage against the very institution meant to deliver justice. His threat earned him a new set of felony charges, earning him an extra eight months to cool down in prison. Tobias Roman's courtroom meltdown was a shocking affront to the judicial system. But how does it compare against the rage that boiled over in the case of Bryce Rhodes, a triple murder suspect in Louisville, Kentucky? Your job is to do your job, not to worry about me. That's what I'm saying. Well, I worry about me. You worry about your Self. On May 4th, 2016, Rhodes shot and killed 40-year-old Christopher Jones on the 800 block of South 41st Street. Two weeks later, Rhodes and two teenage accomplices, Anjuan Carter and Ja'Cory Taylor, beat, tortured, and stabbed two brothers to death. The bodies of 14-year-old Larry Ordway and 16-year-old Maurice Gordon were found in an abandoned lot on River Park Drive by a woman who called 911. Rhodes and his accomplices were arrested on May 24th after 15-year-old Carter confessed to the police. He said that he and 18-year-old Ja'Cory Taylor were in Bryce's apartment when the murder took place. He made my reach on his knees. I'm like, beg for forgiveness. Carter told the police that he saw Bryce Rhodes tie up the two brothers. He tied him up. He tied him up or something. He, he, he tied his brother up. He made his brother sit in the bathroom. And like he put a, put a toboggan over his head. And he put a, he put a, he put a rag in his mouth. And then he stabbed him. Carter described a similar scene for Maurice's brother. We, we moved Maurice to the side. And we brought his brother in. And we put the toboggan over his head. He put the toboggan over his head and put the sock in his mouth. And like, started stabbing him too. Carter said that the brothers had witnessed Rhodes, also known as Rambo, kill a man earlier that month, a possible reason as to why they were killed. And they seen somebody just walking down the street, and they said Rambo's like at the street, and shot him, and Maurice, he was a getaway driver, so he was driving. Since his arrest, Rhodes has been notorious for his disruptive and defiant behavior in court. He threatened the district court judge during a profanity-filled rant that was caught on video. Mr. Rhodes, you can just you can just bring him up right here. Why y'all have me coming out like this for? I think you know why. What? You know, you know exactly why. Out, now, listen, out. stop talking. Oh, you have been. Oh, Are you done? No, I ain't done. You've been charged so in the fourth degree. I'm going to keep talking because I don't want to have to see you back here for this. Rhodes continued with his rant and threatened to find out where the judge lived. She's like, where you live at? What you think at? I don't do. So you're saying you're gonna find out where I'm out? 
I know that you got family, I'll be out. Okay. In another hearing, Rhodes smiled and made gestures at the mother of the victims, Marie Wren. But then another part of it is, if we have a concern, what's the alternative? Because if, then we, if we might get into a situation on the wall where I'm supposed to weigh the pros and the cons. Ma'am, ma'am. Ma Stop it. Look at me. Ma'am! Wren lunged at Rhodes during the hearing and had to be dragged away from court by security. It was a violent, split-second decision. I just, I flipped out. I couldn't take it anymore. No Marie Wren lunged toward the man accused of stabbing her sons to death and burning their bodies. The victim's grandmother, Jackie Party, was outraged by Bryce's behavior in court. My first thought was to, you know, to really just, just to go after him from what he's, the way he's been doing things. This case was set to go to trial in January 2022, but Bryce's defense attorney asked for a competency evaluation. After more than a year, a judge ruled that Rhodes was competent and set a trial date for December 2023. I don't believe that any of the evidence through testimony today is conclusive that Mr. Rhodes isn't just making the uh, decision to not participate with his attorneys. I, I don't think that that necessarily makes him incompetent. Rhodes clearly had no remorse for murdering Christopher Jones, Larry Ordway, and Maurice Gordon. But how does it compare to the meltdown of Damon Kemp, whose rage drove him from a rent dispute to a double murder conviction? Shocking Daytona Beach, Florida. Nineteen-year-old Kemp from Stone Mountain, Georgia, was charged with two counts of second-degree murder and armed burglary. The victims, his roommates, both 19, were found shot and killed in a dreadful scene that left the community in disbelief. Is 19-year-old Damon Kemp tonight facing two counts of second-degree murder. The two victims, both just 19, attended high school in Palm Beach County, and we're learning one of the young men, Trey Ingram, was living in Daytona Beach, while the other victim, Jordan Payton, was visiting at the time of their murders. Are there a lot of students that live in this complex? Yes, sir. Are most of them BCU students? Yes, sir. And um, is it normally a place where murders happen? No, sir. From the moment Kemp was wheeled into court for his trial, an unsettling aura gripped the room. The once quiet young man appeared tormented, seemingly battling invisible demons. His face contorted with a mix of rage and despair as he screamed out, God, multiple times, startling everyone in the courtroom. God! 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 His eerie silence following the outbursts was as chilling as the screams. The judge, unfazed, proceeded with the hearing, denying him bond. I do believe that there is probable cause for the arrest. And under these circumstances, I am not able to grant you bond or any form of pretrial release. The prosecution and defense exchanged heated arguments, the tension in the courtroom palpable. Despite his crime's severity, Kemp's defense pleaded for leniency, pointing to his mental state. Yet, the heart-wrenching testimonies from the victim's families painted a picture of the irreparable damage and anguish caused by Kemp's actions. I called him a child of God so that he understand he had a higher purpose in this world. He used to say that he wanted to be a, a police officer and a you know, you know, that's dangerous. In May, the gavel sealed Kemp's fate as he was found guilty, sentencing him to three life terms. The eerie calmness after his outbursts felt like the lull after a devastating storm. Damon Kemp's courtroom meltdown was a window into the disturbing and sometimes dark realities that unfold in courts. But how does his meltdown compare to the mind-numbing case of Kenneth Freeman? I, I would this Kenneth Freeman, a name that sent chills down Milwaukee, Wisconsin, when he brutally murdered a 33-year-old nurse practitioner. Investigators also say Freeman hid behind a pole in a Freighter Medical College parking lot garage, violently attacked Bowden, drove her to a different parking garage, leaving her there bleeding under her own car. She later died 
As the courtroom's doors swung open for Freeman's hearing, a tense silence hung in the air, but it didn't last long. Within minutes, Freeman erupted into a tirade of screams and curses, revealing a terrifying lack of restraint. I do have reason to believe uh, that competency is an issue in this case. Well, I was going to say, I, this, I would, this nut mother son Left with no choice, the sheriff's deputies deployed a stun gun through his ankle bracelet to subdue him, leaving the courtroom in stunned silence. Victims and their families looked on, their faces flooded with horror and disbelief at the scene unfolding before them. The gavel struck, marking the end of the hearing. Kenneth Freeman was sentenced to life in a mental institution, bringing some closure to his victim's loved ones. Kenneth Freeman's courtroom meltdown was a stark display of uncontrolled rage as we delve deeper into courtroom meltdowns. Next, we uncover more shocking courtroom scenes with our next case, Martez Abram. Stop it. Look at the Yes. That she's shooting him. Yes. And you admit that you shot him in cold blood? Yes. Martez Abrams' name will forever rest in infamy in South Haven, Mississippi. On a fateful day in 2019, he walked into the local Walmart, aiming to settle a workplace dispute with bloodshed. Now to the latest on that deadly shooting at a Walmart in Mississippi. This morning, we're learning about more victims, more about the victims killed by a disgruntled employee who opened fire. It was July 30th, 2019, when Abram, angry from a recent suspension, decided to enact his revenge. Heavily armed, he stormed the Walmart, shooting and killing two managers, Brandon Gales and Anthony Brown, and injuring a South Haven police officer. He was laying on the ground with his eyes open, <clears throat> pulled blood, and I ran up to him. I kneeled down and I looked at him. I said, Anthony, honey, please say Casey one more time. Just say Casey one more time. Brandon was the most loving and caring, hardworking young man that I know. And he truly loved his family. As tension peaked in the courtroom, everyone was caught off guard by the sudden capitulation of Abram as an open meltdown took him over. Stop it. Okay. Look at the screen, sir. Yes. That's you shooting him. Yes. You admit that you shot Yes. Now it's time for justice. A guilty verdict has been turned in by the jury, and the judge is about to lay down the sentence. In count one, I will sentence you to death. In count two, you will be sentenced to death. In count three, you will be sentenced to life. The cold-blooded acts of Martez Abram and the dramatic courtroom confession leave one to wonder about the thin line between a mundane workplace dispute and a murderous rampage. But as shocking as this case was, it pales in comparison to the chilling courtroom meltdown of Seth Welch. Seth Welch, a strange father with unconventional beliefs that would ultimately lead to an unthinkable tragedy. Welch and his wife, Tatiana Fusari, faced the charge of starving their baby girl, Mary, to death. The horror unfolded in Cedar Springs, Michigan, where the couple's negligence led to the heartbreaking demise of their 10-month-old daughter. I believe I'm being unfairly charged and uh, being made an example of for my uh, very strong faith and the trying times that are ahead. The courtroom was tense as the trial proceeded. Every eye was on the couple as the damning evidence was laid bare. It didn't seem smart to me that you would be saving people who weren't the fittest. If evolution believes in survival of the fittest, well, then why are we vaccinating everybody? Shouldn't we just let the weak die off and let the strong survive? Throughout the trial, it became evident that not only did Welch ignore the well-being of his daughter while she was alive, but he also did not report her death to the cops until after 90 minutes of finding her lifeless body. Basically, it got to the point where I was waiting so long, I just kind of went ahead and did it anyway. And we were almost here, so I was just, I was, I was waiting 
As a recording of his cold 911 call was replayed in court, signs of cracks appeared as Seth Welch's mask came undone, the first sign of a crisis from within. Now the trial has come to a conclusion, and Welch's fate is sealed. Infuriating evidence of callous disregard for his daughter's welfare, the world held its breath. On the count of felony murder, count one, guilty of felony murder as charged. On count two, guilty of first degree child abuse as charged, and consistent with the instructions that the jury was given, there are no other boxes that are marked. Now, as Seth Welch faces the consequences of his actions, the haunting memory of his daughter's suffering lingers. But how does his courtroom drama compare to the rage displayed by Ronnie O'Neill? If you think I'm here to play around with y'all, you All right, Mr. O'Neill, please stop using um, swearing language. It's not appropriate in a closing argument. The courtroom was tense as the trial of Ronnie O'Neill commenced. A father accused of the unthinkable. The charges were as chilling as the calm demeanor of O'Neill in court. The date was March 18th, 2018, when tragedy struck. O'Neill brutally abused, kidnapped, raped, and murdered his girlfriend and their nine-year-old daughter, also attempting to kill his 11-year-old son in their Riverview, Florida home. I just saw my dad holding a shotgun and my mom, like, and mom screaming at him. And your father had a shotgun. What happened next? What did he do? My, my mom ran into my sister's room. My mom ran into my sister's room and turned father into the closet. And then my dad said, come in here and uh, come kill this uh, baby bird. But in a bizarre twist, O'Neill chose to represent himself in court. The tension escalated reaching a boiling point as O'Neill cross-examined his own son. The courtroom held its breath as the young boy, displaying unimaginable courage, faced his father, recounting the horror. You stabbed me. Did you see me shoot your mom? No. Did I hurt you that night of this incident? Yes. I did. And how did I hurt you? Me. His defense was a concoction of denial and accusations against law enforcement for fabricating evidence. All through the trial, the jury came face to face with his unhinged tirade. I asked him to tell the jury exactly what he saw that night. And you have to ask yourself why that is. Because he's playing a fraudulent of me beating Kenyatta Barron 15 times when that did not happen. And like I told you earlier, you will know the truth whether in this trial or the next one. Better believe it. Because if you think I'm here to play around with y'all, all right, Mr. O'Neill, please stop using um, swearing language. It's not appropriate in a closing argument. His fate was sealed with a verdict that resonated through the courtroom, guilty on all counts. But it was what the judge said shortly after that put a conclusion to this horrible episode. 19 years I've been at this job. I've seen human beings killed at the hands of others in every way imaginable. You name it, I've seen it. Shootings, stabbings, drownings, suffocates blown apart by uh, cars and DUI manslaughter cases. Horrible things. This is the worst case I have ever seen as far as the facts. So with that, on count one, Mr. O'Neill, I will adjudicate you guilty, sentence you to life in prison with a minimum mandatory of life in prison without the possibility of parole. Count two, I will adjudicate you guilty 
and adjudicate you guilty on count one as well. Count two, adjudicate you guilty, sentence you to life in prison without the possibility of parole, consecutive to count one. On count three, I'm going to sentence you on the attempted murder, adjudicate you guilty, sentence you to life in prison, running consecutive to counts two and consecutive to count one. On count four, on the arson, first degree dwelling, I will adjudicate you guilty, sentence you to 30 years Florida State Prison to one, run consecutive to counts one, two, and three. Ronnie O'Neill's courtroom saga was a chilling narrative of a family torn apart. But as we delve deeper into the heart of darkness, we uncover tales of courtroom meltdowns that send shivers down the spine, just like the case of Keith Ferguson. You came to get a death penalty? Yeah. Keith Ferguson, a name that will forever be remembered for all the wrong reasons, in Kalkaska Community, Michigan. Charged with a double homicide, his courtroom appearance was anything but remorseful. His brazen demeanor peaked as he openly gestured a middle finger at the courtroom, stunning attendees. <laughs> As the trial unfolded, the disdain in Ferguson's actions was a stark contrast to the grave charges he faced. His nonchalant disposition only fueled the rising tension within the courtroom walls. All right, I need to have you raise your right hand for me. Okay, all right. Just pull me back from my Okay, stop. His contempt was a stark insult to justice, highlighting a criminal's cold-heartedness even when facing punishment. Well, I'm not getting into any detail of what happened. If you want to be guilty, you have to say what you did. I'm not saying all right? Well, because the respect and the safety of my children, well, I'm not saying nothing, because they're going to see this. They don't need, they don't need to hear that. Understand what I'm saying? You know, let's just make this painless and not. Give me, give me my 100 years or whatever, and give me the out of here. That's what I'm trying to do. Okay, well, do it. Despite his brazen attitude, justice was served as Ferguson was sentenced to life in prison without parole. As Keith Ferguson's chapter closes, it unveils the dark reality of human nature in the face of law and order. But how does it compare to the case of Randall Moore, wife killer, kidnapper, and rapist, who's facing three life sentences against his former wife, Therese Ann Lynch? Lynch had left her husband and filed a protective order against him. This resulted in Moore kidnapping and killing his estranged wife. Okay, 303 Adams been hit, officer down. Suspects armed with 20 shells. Advises nobody come to the door as he will shoot again. What you just heard was a 911 call placed from Officer Todd Rowland, who responded to the cries from the apartment, where he was then shot and wounded. Only moments later, Moore called 911 as well. I didn't want to do any of this. Okay. But I'm telling you, all I wanted was my son. I just wanted to see my seven month old baby. That's all I cared about. Luckily, shortly after this, Moore surrendered. Now, we go to his trial, where the prosecution opened by explaining the crimes Moore committed. Sickly assaulted her inside that apartment. And then he, he said, get in, the, get in my car. And when she refused to get inside the car with him, he grabbed her like a piece of luggage and he threw her Objection face... argumentative. Threw her face first in the back seat of the car. Police officers announced to one another, there's a young female adult that is deceased inside the apartment. Ladies and gentlemen, they were wrong. That was not just a young female adult. That was Teresa Ann Marie Moore. Then, Moore's defense took the stand. Randy Moore made mistakes that day, but those mistakes do not amount to murder in the first degree, kidnapping in the first degree. They do not amount to in the first degree or attempted murder. Eventually, Therese Ann Lynch's mother got the chance to speak to Moore. What you did to my daughter, Therese Ann Marie Lynch, was evil, hateful, and despicable. You are now dead and rotting and repulsive to me. But before she can finish, Moore interrupts. Read the journal she wrote. She hated you. Thank you, Judge She hated you. Thank you. <laughs> You're a loser. That has got to be the most disgusting thing I've ever seen in my life. I'm not saying what I did was any better, but I thought the reason my wife was and nagging all the time was because she was just that way. I had several no contact orders on me, and you know what the funny thing is? 
The day after a no contact order was put on me, that girl was laying in my bed with me. So she wasn't too worried about anything. It was just something to get a piece of paper to keep me away. But then they always came back. And I'll tell you point blank, I have not one ounce of remorse for Tree Sand's death. It could have all been prevented. All you had to do is let me see my kid. Now you're never going to see her again. Moore went on a vile outburst, telling the victim's mother he had not a single ounce of remorse for what he did, justifying a heinous act right there in court. The judge, appalled by Moore's disdain, came down hard on this cold-blooded killer. I can't believe what I've heard, but I, I, I am really glad you had your right of elocution and you could say everything that you said because if anybody didn't know what a piece of work you were before you start talking, they know it now. And it's been said before and you can't be said enough. You're cowards. You truly are cowards. You prey on women. They give you their love. They give you their trust and you betray that. You betray it by physically and or mentally abusing these women. And they stay with you. And you guys just can't understand why they leave such wonderful men like you. I I've been doing this 31 years. I've never ever seen anybody like you and I hope really I never ever see anybody like you again the court doesn't allow me to punish you any more than I'm doing now if, if I could I would and now more would learn his fate we the jury find the defendant guilty of kidnapping in the first degree guilty of in the first degree, guilty of attempt to commit murder. Randall Moore was sentenced to three life sentences. He remained emotionless as the verdict was read. 